This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. It's time for This Week in Virology. This is a special episode recorded on September 15th, 2014. Hey, everybody. I'm sorry. September 15th, right? Right. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. TWIV is coming to you today from Athens, Georgia. We are at the campus of the University of Georgia. I've been the guests of the College of Veterinary Medicine here. And there are quite a few microbiologists here on campus. There are quite a few virologists. And I've corralled a couple here to talk with me today about virology. And all the way on the left, he is a professor in the Department of Infectious Diseases. Biao He, welcome. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming. I've known you for many years, right? That's right. As a product of the Bob Lamb Lab. Yes. So thanks for coming. And on my immediate left, he is a professor in the Department of Pathology, Zhen Fu. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. Thanks for coming, and thanks uh, for, for the audience for coming today. Uh, my other guest here is a dog who I've corralled. Uh, since it's, it's a College of Veterinary Medicine, I thought we should have a representative, and a live dog wouldn't be uh, very cooperative. So this is it's quite a big dog, isn't it? Yeah. You, you know what kind this is? No? Anybody know it's a greyhound or something like that? I'm in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Well, you're all microbiologists, I guess. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is a great example of uh, my original vision for TWIV. I go on seminar visits such as this one. And um, while I'm here, I meet with faculty during the day and have these great conversations. But nobody ever hears them. So I had years ago the idea of, of a show where we would record some of these conversations. So that's basically what we're doing now. You can imagine that I'm in your office and we're just talking about your science, but we happen to be recording it. And it just so happens that tens of thousands of people will listen. But that's just on the side. So other people can take advantage uh, of this conversation. So we want to talk about your science. But before that, I would like to know We'll start with you, Biao, where you were born and raised and educated, your training. Um, I was born in um, China, and I went to school in Wuhan University. And then I went on to get my PhD uh, from State University of New York in uh, uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Uh, with Bill <laughs> McAllister. Not and, far uh, from me, you know. Uh, that's right. I, I enjoyed city life. And then I went on to uh, did my postdoc with Bob Lamp at the Northwestern University um, from um, there on, after five years, I went to um, Penn State mm -hmm. to start my independent uh, research uh, career as an assistant professor. I um, rise to um, associate and tenured professor, and then moved on to um, University of Georgia. I since become a full professor and uh, um, working on paramix of viruses. So in um, Bill, McAllister's, Bill McAllister's lab, what did you work on? I worked on T7 organ polymerase, I but guess. This is a phage guy. Yeah, okay. it's, a, so it's <laughs> still a virus. So, it's a, so for some of you who only they think are viruses, uh, sure. Right. <laughs> virus means uh, animal virus, but actually phage is a, a very good model. Yeah. And I learned quite a bit. And How did you decide to work on phage? Did you, I mean, were you interested in viruses, or is it just you went to, wanted to go to a good lab? Or maybe you wanted to go to Brooklyn, I don't know. <laughs> good well, no, I, I think at the time, um, in, that's in the uh, early 90s, I think uh, molecular biology is uh, also very, very popular. And also, I feel it was a great tool um, for learning many other things. So I got a great training by studying um, bacteriophage uh, RNA polymerase. Yeah. It's a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And everything you need to learn about transcription, it, it does by this one single enzyme. Yep. It's, it's, it's really a great system to learn. And many of us use this enzyme Oh, today. absolutely. Like, yeah, as yeah. you mentioned today, when you make a, a RNA transcripts, and uh, it's the one of the, um, the best enzyme. Right. So um, why did you choose virology to begin with? Is there anything you can look back on and say, this got me interested in viruses? Or was it just an interesting science for you? It, it's, I have always been interested in virus for a while, but in the, in, when I was finishing my uh, graduate work and uh, doing um, bacterial T7, I actually thought of a couple of other possibilities. One of the things I always tell my students is that I was really interested in neuroscience. I am still mm -hmm. am very interested. 
But what you're interesting, interested in, and also I wanted to see what there is something I can absolutely get my hands on and can do it. And the molecular biology, or like for instance, understanding the memory of molecular biology seems to be pretty uh, difficult without a good model system. Sure. And I, I thought um, uh, virus is one of these nifty things that does everything. And with a single-mindedness of who multiply and be fruitful, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you can learn everything. Yeah. And if you look at the history of virology, really, a lot of things we have learned and a full, um, fundamental yep. uh, biological process came from virus. So I thought, why not? So you know, I've known Bob Lamb, your postdoc mentor for many years. He was he used to be a Rockefeller. Right. I was a student at Mount Sinai. We were both in New York. He was actually on my thesis uh, qualifying committee. So the one the one you take before you uh, start right. your research, well, right? And you probably know about this. <laughs> Is that the one doing? you were signing just now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he came, and he was part of my committee. Uh, wait, and he asked me a question I couldn't answer. He asked me about Maxim and Gilbert sequencing. So this was the hot thing back then. Right. Right. You remember Maxim Gilbert sequencing? Yeah, you had I to did. take a piece of DNA, you had to put a, a, yeah. a radioactive phosphate at both ends, and then you had to cut it with a restriction enzyme because right. you could only have label at one end, and then you would digest that with chemicals to get the ladder of sequencing. So he said, Vincent, what is the one requirement for Maxim and Gilbert sequencing? <laughs> Who knows? It could be, I don't know, have a cup of coffee in the morning. Who knows, right? So he wanted me to say you have to be able to get a unique cutter to separate the ends. Right, oh. right. Restrictions. So I never forget Bob Lamb because of that. Of course, I've known him many years since then. And so you, want to, you moved into animal viruses. You wanted to right. get away from bacteriophages. Why, why did you do that? Well, I, I guess it's a couple of different things. At the time, as, as you mentioned earlier, then you were the one first um, to produce a reverse genetic system for um, positive strain on a virus. That is a very powerful genetic tool you mm -hmm. can use to do a lot of things. And um, PIV, um, parainfluenza virus 5, I was uh, studying and I have been studying, does not, uh, did not have a, a reverse genetic system. And, and, and I thought that's a great opportunity for me to take advantage of molecular biology training and then get into the field of virology uh, studies. And uh, um, I did use quite a few things I learned as a graduate student, particularly um, cloning, working with a large plasmid, and, and that's one of the things that I learned when you go on to do postdoc from my own experience is that you want to find something different, something new, but you also want to get something old that you, you kind of know how to do it. For me, the old was uh, molecular biology. I was pretty good at the cloning, making large plasmids. The new things, of course, um, or um, animal viruses. I had, I had a great time. Bob is a great mentor, and I learned a lot. Okay, Zhen, tell us about your ed education. Where, where are you from? Also, uh, Wuhan, Also right? from China. I also went to college in Wuhan in a different university. Did Central you know each other? Cent no. 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 Central China Agriculture University, called the vet school in the agriculture school. After that, I went down to New Zealand. I did my PhD, actually, in New, New Zealand. Zealand. Uh -huh. Wow. Rotavirus. It's always in virus. Why did you go to New Zealand? The government sent me there. No. <laughs> Make it simple. <laughs> okay. uh, and then... Rotavirus, as you said. I did a rotavirus and herpes virus there. Mm -hmm. But my mind is always rabies. Really? So I went to the late Hilary Kupovsky's lab. To really? To do my postdoc. In and, uh, uh, Worcester. Worcester, the, right? Yeah, wow. At the Worcester and another polio. polio yeah, he made from, another uh, candidate polio vaccine. Polio vaccine. Yeah. 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 So I stayed there for a long time, actually. A, I was a postdoc, and then become assistant professor there uh, before I moved down to UGA. Hmm. So my always interest is in rabies. Well, I, where did you get this interest? Were you bitten as a child uh, or something? Oh, I've been bitten many times <laughs> as a child, but never thought about rabies. Yeah. Really thing got me interested in rabies was uh, before I went to college. And I was a barefoot doctor at that time. That's back in 1976, uh, 77, 76, yeah, a long time ago. And uh, the problem is in those days, in those days we did not have the current silicone vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's the old brain vaccine. So the problem come to me was try to explain to the victims what should they do. 
And we do, we, at that time, we did have to bring made the vaccine, the brain tissue vaccine. And that's number one. Number two, and the, whatever beaten the people mm -hmm. has never been diagnosed, whether they're rabid or not. So therefore, we got, for me, it was very difficult to explain to them, number one, you've been beaten by dog. But number two, the dog may not be rabid. Number three, the vaccine was so bad, it can induce some neurological diseases. So try to tell them, you may not have rabies, you may get a rabies-like problem because of the vaccine. So it's very hard, very difficult to explain to them what yeah. they should or should not do. Okay. So that's I got, of course, in those days, I guess the interest student on the back of the mind did not really come so strong until I went to college. Uh, in China, they, you know, when you go to vet school or medical school, you do not have to do the first degree. So you go, basically, it's more like an undergraduate degree, but with a um, longer time, like we have right. five years. Right. Or six years, depending on the, the, the different school requirement. So when I went to the, the school, uh, this maybe, I guess, the sophomore year, I got interested in my, you know, more on the microbiology side. And it continued because then, of course, more in my mind, the rabies always pop up. Uh, that was I was mentioned to you about 1980 was I first, you know, met David Baltimore mm -hmm. in actually Wuhan when he was to give the seminar there. Right. So it's got more interest in virology. And after that, uh, when we finished the university, then we, in those days, China has a policy, because we, we were the first group after the Cultural Revolution and go back to school. Mm -hmm. So also the first group after graduation or about before graduation, uh, take the so-called national exam. I see. And they will pick the top ones going overseas. That's why the Chinese government sent me to New Zealand. Great. So I didn't, at that time, I didn't have a choice. But I was going there to study, uh, 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 to really do uh, graduate studies in microbiology. I, I was interested in virology, so I studied in you know, mm -hmm. herpes, rotor. But doing that six years in New Zealand, uh, that's really got me back to rabies, okay. I guess. So even though I was there, and uh, I wrote many times to Hillary, the late Hillary Kupowski, uh, I said, I'm interested in rabies. Initially, I thought I would go to UPenn or to his lab to do the PhD. Of course, we'll be at, we'll be at UPenn. But due to, to whatever. Bia, Bia's lab? No, no, no. Hillary. Hillary. No, sorry, you're too young, right? <laughs> He's too young. <laughs> <laughs> He's too young. So uh, when I almost finished my PhD, I wrote him again. He said, Yeah, come over. That's how I, I, I end up yeah, at the Worcester Institute. And it is since then, I've been working on rabies. I met Hillary at a uh, meeting in Switzerland. I sat at a table. This, you have to listen to this. Hillary Koprowski, maybe you'll understand this, uh, Mike Oldstone, yeah. and Bernie Fields <laughs> at the same table. These are giants in virology, and this little guy here, I was just very happy. And so Hillary and I talked about cigars, because well, yeah. he was a big cigar smoker, and he talked about that. And then I got to be his friend, and whenever he submitted a paper to Journal of Virology, he would call me, events, where are the reviews? You know? <laughs> And then uh, just about, I don't know, five, six years ago, I invited him to Columbia to give a history of science talk, and he talked about the history of rabies. And he said, I will come, but I want to buy you a drink afterwards. So after his talk, we went to a bar on Broadway, and uh, he had a Boodle's Gin Martini. That was his favorite, apparently. So Hillary, yeah, he was quite something. So I want to talk about rabies, because we, we talk about rabies a little bit on TWIV, but... We have never had, I think, an expert. So I mean, how many rabies cases a year globally are there? About fifty to 70,000. And these are all fatal, right? They're all fatal. And where are most of them happening? Most are happening in Asia and Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly mostly, you know, the reported cases, of course, is from Asia. Uh, the most is in India and in China. The first, but you have the most cases. And in Africa, possibly many is unreported. So, and these are mainly from dogs biting people? Those are 95 or above are due to dog bite. Okay. And the dogs spread it among themselves, is that yes. right? Yes. But this, they, they don't acquire it from any other reservoir, is that right? That's, that is very interesting, though. But somehow, I guess, to go back to the population biology, 
it, it really comes in waves. Mm -hmm. uh, the waves could be a long period of time. Like in China, since the, 19, the end of 50s or 60s, you can see there are three major waves. The first was short in the middle 50s, and the second one lasted from the end of 70s to almost the beginning of 90s. And then suddenly gone, almost, you know, nothing happens. And maybe three or four years you know, from 96 to 2000, and then pop up again. So still, a, a, now it's still on the way back down. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, again, it, this is the countries where you have good record, you could really yeah. dig out, figure out. Many other countries possibly would not even know what, what is happening. So 95% from dogs, what, what's the other 5% from? The other 5% uh, from wildlife. Uh, wolves is one of the major problems. And uh, they, of course, always reported from rodents. I, I'm not sure how, how to make that out of it, but, uh, but most of it, you know, from wildlife, wolves, um, jackals, mm -hmm. in, those, in those places. Because the bats, it's not that uh, major problem in, in Asia and Africa, even though it's in the in, in Americas. Mm -hmm. um, so are there known transmissions from bats to people? Not in, in the North, Anywhere. in the Americas, yes. Yes. Yeah, this happens almost, in the last past about 20 to 30 years, almost all the cases in the States mm -hmm. are due to bat transmission. Maybe one or two exceptions. So when you acquire rabies from a bat, is it because the bat scratches or bites you, or is there some other mode of transmission? <sighs> this is always debatable. Uh, one of the things we talk about aerosol transmission, I guess, happened in the 1960s in the bat-infested caves. So that's how that theory came about. And then at the beginning of the 1990s, we still think about the same scenario because there were people coming down with the rabies mm -hmm. and they never had any biting history. The only thing they can remember is they've been in the same room as bats. So it was assumed the possibility of aerosol transmission had occurred. Um, that's all the circumstantial evidence we had. Uh, but the, on, the, on the other hand, we found, particularly the virus from bats, we found them a very sort of, even the, they can infect the, the dermis, the epi, epi, epidermal cells, actually very readily. So uh, we are not sure whether the, the bat actually scratched the, the victims and the people who did not know about it or didn't, you know, that could, be, that could have ha happened. It'd be very difficult to think the aerosol transmission. The only aerosol transmission that's without a doubt, it happened again in your state, New York, mm -hmm. in the New York State Health Laboratory. That was because when the centrifuge broke down, when the centrifuge virus, and one of the person got actually infected. He was immunized, and he, that's possibly the only thing we think is aerosol. All right, so that's an unusual case. It's unusual. Because yeah, the centrifuge case. is making a huge aerosol. Absolutely, okay. yeah. So it, probably rabies is not an eradicable disease, right? Because even if you could immunize all the dogs, you would still have wild reservoirs. I, I agree. Right? As, as the late Harry also think about, how are we going to immunize the bats? If we can't take off the bats, probably we of course could, but yeah. uh, currently there's no, no technology-wise, science-wise, we do not yeah. have the, the tools. So the most important preventative is to immunize dogs, since Correct. most of the infections come from dogs. Yeah, and then is you immunize the dogs, you cut the, 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 the cycle between the wildlife right. and the humans. Right. I guess that's the okay. major, major issue. So now walk me through the disease. You, I get bitten on the hand by a dog. What, what does the virus do? The virus doesn't matter where you infect. These viruses, I asked you the same question earlier. The virus will find the nearest nerve fibers. Mm -hmm. uh, most likely through the neuromuscular junction. It doesn't have to replicate before doing that. This is always, again, not a debatable issue. <laughs> I do not think so, but it does not really replicate. It's just from there they find the neuromuscular junction and get into the nerve fibers. 
And then it travels up. Then it travels from the periphery to the nearest ganglion with, of course, okay. the neural body. Then they start replicating. Okay. And then they go to the spinal cord to the, to the brain. So this takes a long time. In fact, the further you are away from Correct. the CNS, the longer the incubation. Why does it take so long? They said because the, the transplant is very passive. So a theory goes is the virus attached to one of those motor, motors, you know, the, 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 like uh, uh, the dining. Right. So they've right. attached the microtubules. So there's a passive transport since it takes so long. Right. So that's how, how the incubation period. It's a little expand. weird because it's external positive. transport is not all that slow, right? Yeah. So maybe where the virus is. Yeah. Oh. All right. So eventually the virus gets into the central nervous system. Yes. And then what happens? What happens? We do not know. Oh, we don't. don't say we don't know. We know partially. Once the virus gets into the the, the, the CNS, definitely the virus start replicate in neurons. In neurons, only in neurons. After replication, what do we know about is the virus will come back to the periphery, mm -hmm. the salivary gland, or actually the other peripheral organs. You know, again, back through the nerve fibers. Mm -hmm. It never had the viremia. So it only comes through the, fib the, the neural fibers. You can end up in the heart, in the kidney, but still, again, it's where the neural, the nerve fiber is. So not necessarily going to the individual organs to replicate. But one of the major issues we talk about, when you talk about, you know, polio, is definitely dead, dead end. You go to the nerve system, that's it. But rabies, in humans, I think the same. This is a dead end. Mm -hmm. But in animals like dogs, like whatever we're talking about, this is not the end. That's what they do. They somehow they induce the, the neurological problems, particularly the, the madness. That's what rab rab rabies, rabbit is all about. So making the animals mad, when they're mad, they're going to bite other animals. This is the only way the virus could be transmitted. Through the saliva, right? Yeah. If without the biting, without the virus, the rabies... Right. Been long dead. In humans, is there virus in the saliva as well? Uh, very little. But much more in dogs, okay? Yeah. And it gets there from the CNS or from peripheral From sites? the CNS coming back through the nerve fibers. Okay. But that's not the issue. The humans, I don't know, but in humans, even the humans can get in the hyper, hyperactive stage, mm -hmm. but usually humans do not go to bite another human. No. <laughs> but animals do. <laughs> So you think that's a behavioral modification that ensures spread? Could to it the be? Virus? Could be, right? Could it be? Or, or the virus has not been adapted to humans well because you know, there's no human-to-human -human transmission. Yeah. Well, in bats, the virus doesn't do this, right? The bats do. The bats are fine with rabies infection. No, no, no. They still get infected. They, they still do, develop disease. Do they, they develop die. disease? Uh huh. Do, they don't get mad though, right? They do. <laughs> Otherwise, how they transmit? They definitely get so into that stage. So bats transmit to each other by oh, yes. scratching by, or by biting. By, okay. Yeah, they do too. All right. But in the bats, was very. Uh, we we have a group of people in the UGA. They work on this situation. Looks like the immunity in the bats is very short lived, mm. about six months. So they can be reinfected. Very. So they don't die. Readily. They don't die. For those who do not die. Oh, there's some who don't. Okay. Oh yeah. Got it. All right, now in people, you can give the vaccine right after the bite. Correct. And you have time to prevent CNS infection. Correct. I don't understand how that works. What, what's the mechanism? The mechanism because of the long incubation yeah. period. So therefore, you want to stick in a vaccine, the, the immune response kicks in much faster than the virus tra uh, you know, transport in the system. Uh, another issue is because, you know, uh, for the so-called post-exposure prophylaxis, mm -hmm. vaccination is only one of the, you know, one, one of the uh, uh, mechanisms. In addition to the vaccine, we're supposed to give them antibodies, the hyperimmune globulin. Right, right. So what the hope is the hyperimmune uh, globulin will neutralize the virus at the site of bite. Right. So to, you know, once you neutralize them, they will not be able to get into the nerve system. In the meantime, you immunize them so the, the active immunity will kick in. Mm -hmm. And if there's any virus left, so the active immunity could take care. So of the any rest. virus peripherally. Yeah. But any virus that's already in the nerve would not be affected by antibodies. Theoretically, right? no. All right. So whenever you, someone is protected from rabies by post-exposure prophylaxis, 
it is antibodies that you've either injected or developed that remove peripheral virus. Yes. There's no way for the antibody to get in. The CNS. The CNS. That's, that's the theory, how it goes. So, and, go ahead. Yeah. All right, so uh, one thing I forgot to ask you, once the virus is in the CNS, you said it replicates and humans get these furious symptoms. Do we know what causes those? We do not. That's the area. We have very little research, you know, being conducted yeah. in the last, it's, you see, since the time of Pasteur, you know, more than 100 years now. Uh, it's very little been done. Uh, theory goes, because of the problems, you know, humans or animals alike, when they come down with the rabies, if you do autopsy, you mm -hmm. do mortem, uh, post-mortem examination, one of the major things we see is we see very little pathology. People who have died of rabies, uh -huh. very little CNS. Very little you know. CNS yeah. structural you know, problems. Right. So the hypothesis goes the virus must you know, induce neuronal dysfunction. So with that, the dysfunction eventually caused the death of the human or, or animals. That, that was, I suppose, what it goes. What does that mean? <laughs> that means I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our own thinking, perhaps we have some evidence, is when the, when the virus infects neurons, mm -hmm. one of the things it does is actually uh, in somehow down regulate the presynaptic membrane, the neurotransmitter vesicles, mm -hmm. some of those fusion proteins. So what happens when the neurotransmitter vesicles, when they cannot fuse uh, with the presynaptic membrane, so the neurotransmitters cannot be released, and so the, you know, to, to the postsynaptic neurons. Mm -hmm. So therefore, maybe the neuronal sing singlonin is blocked somehow. Yeah. We have some evidence. Okay. Can you take neurons in culture and infect them and, and measure electrophysiological changes? Yes, yes, we can do. But we don't know what they mean. The, that, in that case, the problem we have is the in vitro and in vivo is very, very different. Yeah. This is a virus that's very, very strange. Uh, in vivo, um, you see, the, we are, we are, so far we know that the rabies virus only infect neurons. But in vitro, you can actually infect many different types of cells, neurons, epithelial cells, whatever, whatever you, you try. Eventually, they're going to adapt. They're going to replicate in other cells. So it, at the initial bite, there is no replication, right? That's what I think. No, any kind of epithelial cell whatsoever. It just enters the nerve and eventually replicates yeah. in ganglia. The, or, the only okay. report in the early days use animal models. Right. The virus may replicate in the muscle cells. Mm -hmm. There's only evidence that have ever been shown before. Do we understand why the, the tropism is so restricted? You know, it's I like don't polio. Know. Polio only replicates in a couple of tissues, do we understand? By this polio, you come to the guts, right? Yeah. And you affect the epithelial cells? Um, of the gut only. Only, yeah, gut only. Yeah. So, but this one doesn't matter where you do. It only goes to neurons. If you, can you infect mice with rabies virus? Oh, yeah, easily. If you take a mouse without an uh, interferon receptor, what happens? Uh, even with, new, even with, uh, with interferon, they infect very well. And if you take away the interferon uh, system? They, they die quick. Of but course. Do, do more cells get infected or are the same cells? It's still the same cells. cells. So that I think so far. The, I have the, the, the neurons, yeah. Okay. It's really weird that weird. the virus can do this. Must be doing very interesting things to neurons, which seem would be interesting to, to figure out, right? Maybe it's, the, you know, I still think this is the only way the virus is transmitted. You have to get the animal mad so they're going to bite other animals. This, <laughs> I don't know this. It has evolved to do Whether that. Yeah. This is the, the consequence of a neuron infection was because of prerequisite, I don't know. Yeah, I but think it's an interesting thing to, to figure out why, but I think, as you say, a lot of people can't figure it out, and it's hard to do these experiments it's in very animals, difficult. right? Now, a lot of your work is concerned with antibodies getting into the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. How did you get interested in that? The partially we started about, two, I guess, 10 years ago, we're looking at the pathogenesis. Uh, one of the things that really got our, in, our interested is that somehow we also do comparative, comparative sort of pathogens in that sense, which means it's a wild type of virus mm -hmm. and a lab attenuated. 
what we found is that lab attenuated virus can readily induce the innate immune response. The wild type of virus does not. So in, an, in a wild type infected animal, there's no innate, there's no interferon response. Very little. Very little. And then, this, then this attenuated virus is made in your lab, is that right? Or it's, no, some are made from Pasteur. Oh, it's a vaccine strain. Oh, your vaccine strain, yeah. Is the human uh, vaccine atten live attenuated? No, they are inactivated. It's inactivated. They are inactivated, okay. yeah. Does so, the, I'm sorry, does the, does the vaccine induce innate immunity? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, the inactivated no, that's vaccine. That's inactivated, no. No? The inactivated it doesn't. Don't. Okay. It's, the, it's right. the, the, the life attenuated. Okay. So that's what we got interested. And uh, then, of course, you induce innate immunity, you're going to induce the adaptive. So what we found is if you infected the mice with a wild type virus, of course, the, uh, if you don't do anything, they're going to die. One hundred percent will die. Mm -hmm. But then we start giving, think about what are, what are the best we can do to control the infection. If we give them uh, just the antibody in the in the blood, it does not work either. That you have to do is you have to have the antibody. No doubt about it, the neutralizing antibody. We also have to have the blood brain barrier enhancement. Mm -hmm. Without the blood brain barrier enhancement, the antibody will stay in the periphery. We're not going to the CNS. If you're not going to CNS, nothing will happen. But if you do them at the same time, if there's a very little antibody leak through the blood brain barrier, they somehow they can contain the virus infection. I should get rid of it. Clear, clear the virus infection in the brain. So the attenuated uh, virus can induce those antibodies. Correct. It can also enhance the blood brain barrier. And they will get into the CNS. So if you don't challenge the mice, they're protected from CNS disease. No, we actually just infect them first yeah. with the wild type. And then later on, we stick the attenuated virus. Okay. It has to go to CNS, though. Yeah. You if have we to do the periphery, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it works not, not so as So it's not good. a good human treatment. Uh, uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's also debatable. <laughs> So we have to move on that now. Instead of using the attenuated virus, right. now we give them antibodies, neutralizing antibodies. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to use something that is going to enhance the blood brain barrier. At the moment, we use one of the chemicals, MCP1. Mm -hmm. It works pretty good. And we can save 50 to 80% of the mice from right. different disease. Right. Now, you said the attenuated strain induces antibodies. Now in in people infected with wild virus, well, most of them die, so I guess you never know. They don't make antibodies, I presume. Eighty percent of the patients, they do not develop neutralizing antibodies mm -hmm. at the time of death. And that's because they don't, the virus doesn't induce an innate response, which is required for... I think partially, that. though. That's another issue we've been bugged. Um, the virus does induce antiviral responses, but just not neutralizing antibodies. It does in induce antibodies against the nuclear protein, for example. So the, the, long, mm. the in human patients, almost 80% of the patients will have antibody against the nuclear protein, but 80% of them will not have the neutralizing antibodies. This is a sort of a di yeah, yeah. you know, something we to try to work out how, how, how that happens. In one of your papers, you mentioned that some of the survivors of rabies, the ones who are not immunized, who are surviving because of the Milwaukee procedure, Milwaukee, whatever, yeah. a few of those have antibodies, yes. neutralizing antibodies in the CNS. In the CNS, yeah. So why did they develop neutralizing antibodies? <sighs> That's was very few. It's yeah. about 80%, it's not the 20%. Yeah. 20% uh, still develop. Uh, the neutralizing antibodies. Oh, so the 20% uh, develop neutralizing and they die That's anyway. That's the die, yeah. <laughs> okay, because the it antibodies don't get into the brain, I guess. One is the, yeah. Yeah, too okay. late or they do not get into the brain. And then a few who, are, who happen to be survivors, the virus... The survivors are almost, the, the, the Milwaukee protocol treated, those are survivors actually, they all have antibodies in the CF, CSF. Mm -hmm. Not only the neutralizing antibodies, but also in the CSF. That's a very... Peculiar situation. So we don't know why that. We that don't is. know why, and we don't know if those antibodies played any role in their protection either. Uh, right? I, that I would think, uh, yes, probably they did. Yeah. They probably did. So is um, so you have a, a person with rabies who 
is too late in the disease, already has disease, so at that point you can't vaccinate, right? Vaccination will not work anymore. Is there some uh, therapeutic value to giving them monoclonal antibodies and then something to, to permeabilize the blood-brain barrier? That's that, what we try to do. In people, though, is this a therapeutically yeah. viable approach? It could. Could be. I guess, you know, we look back in the old days, they treated patients with antibodies, but they did intravenous or IP. Yeah. So, but again, it doesn't matter how you, how you do it, if antibody will not be able to cross yeah, sure. the barrier. So either we can, we, that's what we're talk, thinking about, can we directly inject the antibody into the CSF? Because that would uh, diffuse oh, into yeah, the brain. Sure. That's another issue, something we're going to try in, in, the, in the mouse is too small, we can't do much about it. So maybe you say a, a large animal uh, like this, model, yeah. yeah, might be able to to, to <laughs> fight out here. Yeah. Um, has that ever been done in people to put uh, neutralizing antibodies in the CSF? No. I guess in a rab rabid patient, it'd probably be hard to do, right? Or you could sedate. No, that that can be easily done. Yeah. Yeah. And has not so why done. hasn't it been done? No, there's no animal data on it. Because of the earlier times they tried. They gave neutralizing antibody did not work. So sort of, you know, people didn't really revisit that uh, situation. And we're thinking about giving the CSF then. So that's another issue. It has not been addressed. Yeah. So is your, is your idea to accumulate data which would yes. lead to a trial, a clinical trial? Of that's what we hope on the, on the, on the route we'll get into. Yeah. So this would not be used in the U.S., I presume, because aren't, there aren't enough cases of rabies, right? It would be used elsewhere where there are 55,000 plus cases of rabies. Sure. Occur. Even in the States, you know, every, we still have two or three patients each year. Right. If it can, if it can be, if it works, it will be great. Yeah. So is there a uh, need for a new vaccine? This is an old technology vaccine, right? Yeah, the older vaccine works. Of course, if it's a better vaccine, the, the most the problem with the current vaccine is the cost. It's too expensive. That's why it's still 50 or 70,000 people die because in, the, in, the, in the developing countries, yeah. they cannot afford. It still costs a lot. In the States, the combination therapy uh, treatment with vaccine and the hyperimmunoglobulin, uh, it costs more than $3,000. Think about in, in the in the different countries. Yeah, sure, sure. It's just really prohibitive. Yeah, that's another issue. We are working on to see with come up with a better a better haven't vaccine. You haven't you guys collaborated on improve, making a different yeah. vaccine? Right. Uh -huh. If yeah. I remember, I saw a paper where you put a rabies protein in a paramyxovirus vector. Is that correct? Uh -huh. Right. And does that protect? What's the animal? Mouse you try? Oh, we tried the mouse. Protects them? Mm -hmm. So are you, are you planning to bring that as far forward that's, as you That's can? what we are working on <laughs> as we're speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be an inactivated vaccine? or an It would be a life. Oh, an infectious vaccine. And yeah. how, how would it be in, uh, injected? Um, right now we have tried the mice uh, with intranasal because the uh, vector um, backbone is a uh, respiratory right. virus to begin with. We also try an uh, intramuscular. That works. And we also uh, with mind uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, vaccinating a wild animal, we also try the oral and uh, intranasal mm -hmm. um, uh, is the best uh, route um, uh, vaccine, the route right now. Right. Um, well, not only we're trying um, uh, uh, preventative vaccine, we're also trying to see um, whether the, the vaccine can be used as a therapy. And we're making very good progress good. on that. Yeah. It's great. Is there anything I missed? Nothing? So we're never going to get enough information anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Biao, let's talk a little bit about uh, your work. You work on paramyxoviruses. Right, so both negative strand virologists. Right. We actually met at the meeting first time. One of the meetings. Uh, <laughs> negative we're strand virus meeting? Right. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I used to work on negative strand viruses, but so I used to be very positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got more positive. That's right. Um, what, um, so para-influenza type 5 is one of your main uh, viruses of study, and um, you use it as a vector for delivering, or trying to deliver viral antigens, right? Right. Where, where did this virus come from? Good question. And uh, that's really, um, initially, the virus was um, isolated from um, African green 
a monkey cells. And actually, back in the days in Rockefeller, they would study, um, I believe, antivirus. And then some very astute and, and researcher find out when they're doing plaque assay. And that's one of the things the students should learn, not just getting what you want, but also actually pay attention to what you do to find <laughs> out there are two sides of plaques in the, in the experiment. So they got what they were looking for, which is um, this uh, non, um, I think, antivirus. And also they find out there's a, a different side, which turned out to be a different virus. So this was from a human specimen. They were looking for adenoid viruses. Right, right. Okay. And then they were, I, I'm not sure exactly what's the, the, the specimen they got, but they were yeah. studying those things. And then they thought this something must be from um, monkey because of the, the cells they used. So they called it SV5 for many years. SV5, I remember that, yeah. Right, okay. so back in the days in Rockefeller. So they, um, they worked on this for many years. And I think in the 60s, 70s, they started seeing um, dogs with cannot cough that they can isolate the virus um, from dogs with Kindle cough and actually made a vaccine um, from those viruses. And it's been still used today. So you have, if you get a dog, you get vaccinated with Kindle cough, you actually have been exposed or um, working with um, this virus because later on, they, as you know, with the technology and advancement, we find out they're actually one and the same virus. So, so long story short is that we initially in isolated as a contaminant from monkey cells, and but really from um, um, naturally we have isolated it from dogs. So um, I guess it's appropriate to have a, a dog right here, right? right? So we were in the vet school studying um, para, um, So the name got the virus have changed has been changed in, in 2009 by ICTV uh, into para influenza virus five from okay. SV five. So because we. Because in the in the nature, if you take monkeys, they are now serum converted. You could not isolate the virus, but the monkey can be infected by this virus without any signs of the symptoms. Okay. Of course. Are people infected with PIV5 also? That's a, that's a very good question. So we have done a limited study in Athens area that when people donate blood, when they and we got some um, blood sample and we did a, a neutralizing an antibody measurement, right. we find out about 29 percent people. Um, have uh, or had in those samples um, uh, neutralizing antibody against the PIV5. And my, my theory, of course, is um, because the dogs get vaccinated yeah. and they will um, stay in the respiratory tract for a few days. So if you kiss your dog and have very close contact, you may have been exposed to Tell the my virus. kids not to kiss our dog all the time. They don't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> Maybe well, they're getting immunized. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so they've been exposed, <laughs> which is, in a way, you can argue the virus is quite safe. Since we yeah, right. So that's why it's a good vector. What's one reason why it's a good va vaccine vector? Because it doesn't cause disease in people. Right, right. Uh, it replicates in the respiratory tract? Uh, absolutely, yes. So, the, the, of course, the, then I want to point out one thing. When we are um, interested in developing a vaccine, the number one issue, as you all know, is safety. And it has to be safe to begin with. And so the, this is one of very good in the future that um, we, now, we know that the virus is being exposed in human and, and there's no disease and we, can, we know of. And, and so, of course, uh, every day we do this an experiment with our uh, veterinary students. When they come in, they have to do clinical rotation. So when you uh, vaccinate dogs, you tend to hold them with drip things. Right now, the Kendall cough vaccine is uh, intranasal. So they drip things in the nose of the dogs. And a lot of dogs don't like them, you know, not like we're waterboarding them, but it's just, you know, uncomfortable. So they will sneeze. Yep. So the people in the room and will get exposed to it. So we, we so it's, it's real time. We have students being exposed. Yeah. Uh, have you daily. done sero surveys of the students? That's one thing I, I really like to do. And that's one of the, the things I uh, want to get around the right uh, an IRB yeah. for, yeah, yeah. to do that in a real kind of a track. The, the before and after. But of course, uh, many of our students in the vet school, they already um, had experience, volunteered in veterinary um, clinics and hospitals, et cetera. So I suspect they may have already been um, exposed. Right. So they may be, um, in terms of a population, is somewhat skewed in terms of a PIV5 exposure. So what, tell us some of the virus antigens you're putting in PIV5. So one of the things we initially started out, as you know, I started out in Bob's lab when I first made this reverse genetic system to work for PIV5. And Bob's lab also works with flu. So I said, hey, well, you know, it's the convenience. I just took a, a flu gene, put it in. And, and uh, so from uh, that point on, we started working on um, flu vaccine using PIV5. So we have done um, 
really um, a lot of work on H5M1, and I think the, the flu vaccine and H5M1 vaccine we have made have been very efficacious, uh, work really well. So we put the HA, we put uh, N -N -N NA, we put NP in, they all work. And most recently, and with a paper being reviewed, we actually took um, H7, N9, and H7, put in the PIV5. This is one of those really interesting and case and, and in, for flu, we know really well that you need HA antibody to have a protection, at least when you have HA. What's really interesting for H7, as you know, that um, H7 is not very uh, immunogenic. It means that if you put H7 on um, protein itself into animal, they tend not to generate antibody at all. And that was what we saw. But yet we, see, we saw protection with the PIV5 expressing H7. And then we went on to study to find out actually you don't really need antibody to have a protection against H7 and 9. What's most interesting for us, and then we went on further to test this uh, vaccine in, in guinea pig. Mm -hmm. In guinea pig, we can generate an antibody against H7, but those antibody didn't seem to be protective at all, which is it's interesting. And then, then, that, then what can you use as a criteria for for determining a, a efficacious yeah. H7 vaccine, because as you know, everyone's using um, HA titer sure. and as, a, as, a, <laughs> right. as a, the only criteria for um, um, licensure of a vaccine, because you cannot really do um, um, efficacy study in the field with H7 and right, 9. Right. So it's interesting, the H7 is somehow different. Right? It's very different. I mean, we, all, we were surprised because when we did the antibody transfer, experiment side by side h7 antibody did not protect hmm. but h5 antibody yeah. did at least you know, in mice so whether this same um, phenomenon can be observed in human or in ferrets we, we don't know yet yeah so how far do you want to take these piv5 influenza virus vaccines well so we are uh, of course hoping to develop vaccine for human and uh, um, but meanwhile, we're also trying to see whether we can develop vaccine using PIV5 for animals as well. So for, um, for instance, one of the ways to block an uh, avian influenza uh, into a human population really is can we actually uh, vaccinate the chicken? Or uh, that's where the like, similar you know, blocking um, the transmission of rabies by vaccinating the dogs. Can we uh, do a, a vaccination in chicken? And it turned out, uh, yes, we can, but the, the issue and is economics. That is, you, if you want to make a vaccine for chicken, it really has to be very, very um, inexpensive, which turned out as a feature of a PIV5 because it grows really well in, in normal tissue culture cells. It grows 10 to the eighth. And, 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 um, but in case we have to um, use, say in chicken, we have done in alpha inoculation, a couple of hundred, a few hundred PFV would be sufficient. So. Um, the, the, the vaccine works well in, in, in ovo for chicken. And we also uh, are developing um, uh, vaccines for um, um, companion animals because the, the, the backbone itself ha has already been used in, in dogs as a kind of cough vaccine. So naturally, uh, you can imagine we can put in all kinds of antigens uh, into um, the, this uh, virus and this uh, vector to make a vaccine. Is it easier to get a a veterinary vaccine license than a human vaccine? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So the, the one of the things we do with a veterinary vaccine is uh, different is that uh, instead of um, three, uh, four stages in a way, um, you know, say uh, um, um, phase one, two, three, and four, which is really look at the um, uh, adverse effect, is that you um, do, uh, of course, you all have to do the um, preclinic study, and then you do the phase one in an animal is that you essentially do a laboratory testing and then, of course, follow the USDA's guideline. And then you go on to do the um, phase two or field study. And if that works, um, then you're good to go. And for, of course, human, you have the phase one, phase two, phase three, and you get to, essentially, after phase three, you can sell, but you know, phase four, essentially, is the, the last, essentially, the uh, monitoring. Right. And you can still pull your vaccine out of the market. So it's, it's relatively um, speaking, um, um, uh, takes less time. I think it's great how a virus that was a contaminant of cell culture initially and, I don't know, Bob Lamb decided to, to work on it and now it turns out to be useful. It just shows you how you have to let scientists just 
work on what they get interested in, right? Oh, absolutely. I think it's, a, if, like I said, if I know what we're doing, a lot of times we, <laughs> we don't really don't, I, you know, we just find things that's interesting. And like yeah, I, yeah. I mentioned before, many years ago, people thought, the, the, as, as, uh, you know, sometimes, oh, I, work, I want to work with the virus that's really um, and, and scary, you know, Ebola or something. But sometimes you just have to work with virus that's fascinating. And the, I think the PIV5 is one of those fascinating virus. It infects everything. And literally every cells, and we have a, since I come here, we try the virus in 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 mouse, in um, um, in cotton rat, in uh, guinea pig, in hamster, in ferrets, in cat, dogs, pigs, horse, and non-human primate. It infects everything. It doesn't do anything to them in, in terms of causing disease. Make, they think, make antibodies, though. Right, right, they make antibodies. You can isolate the virus. Think about what could be more successful virus. Right? Does is the virus the, get in the CNS? Do you know? Not that we know of, and thankfully. And uh, again, <laughs> that's one of those things. Um, um, at, at one time, we really want to nail this virus to some kind of a disease, so we can say, hey, at least we can show there's some disease. We couldn't. I mean, I, I personally don't see much of evidence of that. And so they say, why not take this as a vaccine vector? And, and so that's really the things we've been working on. You know, besides the flu, we have. Uh, and worked on rabies, and we also uh, developed a new um, respiratory syncytia uh, virus vaccine, and we are uh, fortunately funded to do HIV, and uh, um, and as well as uh, mycobacterial tuberculosis vaccine by NIH, and you know we just have to try to develop a malaria. So all the difficult vaccine <laughs> we can try in HIV, TB, and then we will we'll get the whole trifecta of and malaria. So another one you work on is mumps, right? You right. Put you're trying to make a new mumps vaccine. With tell us a little bit why we need a new mumps vaccine. Well, so as you know, we have a, a very very good vaccine, and it was it's a great story. You know, uh, Maurice Hillman and took a, a, a sample from her daughter and the isolated virus in the past. Turned out to be we're very lucky in the sense that the vaccine to be very well attenuated and it's been used for over. Um, 47 years, mm -hmm. I think, now. It's part, of, 60, it's part right. of MMR, right? I'm part of MMR, wonderful vaccine. And then of course, and as you, some of you may have heard about the story of um, this uh, um, Wakefield fiasco and, and have this uh, bogus connection between MMR and, uh, and autism. So um, we're in the US, we have done a good job in, in vaccinating our population. But in the UK, because of that report, um, the, the vaccine um, coverage, in UK dropped, and sure enough, mumps and uh, uh, measles came back. And because of the interaction between the US and the UK, I think in, in 2006, uh, one of the largest uh, mumps outbreak occurred, uh, originated in Iowa, the, the, the Indica case, the, the original carrier of um, the mumps came from a UK uh, exchange student. So um, since then, we have the several um, outbreaks and with uh, mumps. And uh, um, one of the, the issue is um, we have only one vaccine has been used. And th there are other vaccines developed by other country, and they had issues uh, and with the safety, so they were withdrawn from the market. So and then you have, as, as a virologist, we know if you have a, one vaccine that works really well, but then you have uh, countries with uh, outbreaks and, uh, and circulating virus, they, over the 40, 50 years, they tend to um, s uh, change a little bit. So um, right now, there are um, two theories on why we have, um, at least two theories, why we have um, uh, uh, more and more outbreaks. One is because the vaccine uh, immunity winds over, over time. And another possibility is maybe the combination of both is that uh, the original vaccine was developed using a genotype A. And the circulating strain right now is a genotype G. So it's gone quite a bit of a change. Is and this not, so our genotype G virus is not neutralized by antibodies against A? Uh, it, about a half, about half. So if you take the, the, uh, the, the um, vaccine generated antibody you, or compelled antibody generated by um, circulating virus, it's about 50% uh, efficiency uh, in terms of neutralizing um, a GMT titer. So your idea is that the circulation allowed by the reduction in immunization in the UK and elsewhere has allowed for antigenic variation to occur. Well, that's a part of the reason, of the and idea. also maybe the, the vaccine again, and the, the, uh, maybe 
uh, winding immunity over time. So can you, can, like you can see, the, as I mentioned before, maybe it's half of the neutralizing and efficacy. Then when two things come together, you may have a problem okay. uh, at your hands. So have you made a, a PIV5 with a genotype G? What do you use, the HA or the, the H or the F or both? Right. So in that case, actually, I went back to um, generate the reverse genetic system for mumps because mumps is very closely related to PIV5. And I thought, why not use mumps and instead of introducing an entirely um, new virus into um, human? At that point, it was about 10 years ago now uh, I was doing this. And another reason I'm doing this is because the traditional way of making mumps vaccine is to throw uh, through the passing of the virus in the tissue culture cells. And then you hope they attenuate. But we don't really have a good handle on how many passages uh, you need to have to make them uh, attenuate. So uh, Maurice Hillman did a great job because that's really attenuated. A couple of vaccines developed by other companies or countries that didn't attenuate enough, but passing. So again, with the new technology, genetic engineering, we can do designing uh, vaccines, so to speak. So we made a reverse genetic system and then we took out the genes we suspect that are important for uh, uh, pathogenesis or virulence factors. And then we got candidates now that are um, highly attenuated, but yet um, very well um, replicating in tissue culture cells because you need a good uh, replication in tissue culture cells to, produ uh, to produce large quantity, but in vivo, they're highly attenuated using a model system. So these are the SH and the V genes? Right, SH are, and the V gene deletion. Which are innate antagonists, right. is that correct? exactly. Okay. So the, the uh, V protein in, and, uh, it, uh, um, blocks interferon signaling, and the SH um, blocks TNF alpha signaling. So when we take those genes away, the virus can still replicate well in okay. tissue culture cells, but they are highly attenuated. And they can't revert because they're deletions. Right, right. So the, the, in terms of safety, again, come back, when we do vaccine development, the number one issue is safety. But all this, would, it's only possible because people have studied function of a V protein and SH. Sure. And actually, a very uh, first um, paper published by Rick Randall on the V protein functions, well, V's ability to cause degradation of style one was done in PIV5. And again, this is a virus that doesn't do anything to human. And it has come back to the point we kind of alluded on early, that you, we really need to support people doing work that not necessarily have immediate impact. Because th those in seminal work from Rick Randall point out, and of course later on with um, Kurt Horvath doing work showing the V protein can cause degradation of STAT1. And then, of course, when, we, when I started looking at the, what kind of gene can I take out from mumps, it become apparent V gene will be a good candidate. Now without those work, it's gonna be much longer, maybe harder sure. for me to, yeah. to do what I did. Do you think that uh, if, you give, if, you, if this vaccine were licensed, for example, and you give it to people. Is it possible that um, it could recombine with an endogenous paramyxovirus and restore these, these genes? That is a fascinating uh, question, which you really, well, I'm glad you asked, because this is one of the, the, the features of uh, uh, negative gene RNA virus. And for years, I've been uh, kind of trying to uh, extort a virtue of why negative gene RNA virus is ultimately a better virus as a vector. Because as you know, the, the, the difference between negative strain and the positive strain RNA virus in terms of genome, they all got RNA, and of course, besides the weight polarity, is that the negative strain RNA virus has this almost like a mini chromosome kind of structure. You got the N protein wrap around the RNA really tightly. So there is really no um, easy way for a, a viral genome to recombine with another viral genome, unlike in the case of a positive, because the, the RNA is naked. Mm -hmm. So we have done the experiment. Um, uh, my student, um, uh, Shannon, has passed so the virus, if we put in extra gene in, into our genome, in the case of a, a positive strain, very quickly they get looped out, basically because they don't like them, but also because there are a lot of opportunity, opportunity to recombine yeah. with others. But the negative strain, we can pass them for 10 generations at least, the gene's still there. Nothing happens to it. So again, so that really tells us that the virus genome is very stable. It's very unlikely in the case of uh, mumps and any other negative strain to really recombine with others. Mm. That's great. So, so people have tried really hard to get recombination. They don't see it, right? Interesting. 
So um, how far do you, have you taken this uh, new mumps vaccine? Is it, is, I presume you have it in animals, right? Right. And are you going to, does it look good there? Is it neutralizing and protective? Right. What is the disease that you try and protect against it in animals, say? Right. So what, again, this comes back to the issues about the, um, the animal model. And actually, um, as you, you are really well aware, when you work with poly, unless you have a small animal model, it's very difficult uh, to pursue. But we have actually uh, taken the effort to develop animal model. And then Adrian, my student, is doing work on uh, using an uh, interferon uh, receptor knockout, again, to see whether we can use the full um, protective uh, um, uh, immunological assays. But also we have uh, tried uh, in ferrets, because the ferret is a good model for respiratory infection in human. Um, that didn't really work out that well. But we did try a uh, rhesus macaque, and we find out actually in rhesus macaque, the infection is very similar to human. You get infection, and there is an incubation period, and then you get um, um, parotitis in, in monkey. So I think what we like to do is, of course, take our uh, vaccine candidates and to see whether they, uh, we can do challenge in the right. protection right. and efficacy experiment in monkey. So then you have preclinical data, you would do a phase one. Right. You have to partner with someone to do that, right? It's very expensive. Right. So the, the idea for us, the, the, the ho my hope is because uh, right now everyone, at least in the U.S., in, in many countries, have uh, two doses of MMR. And, and so I hope the, the safety uh, phase one will relatively be easy because then we'll, and the idea is if you have winning immunity, and a lot of kids in college tend to have a lower titer of uh, yeah. um, mumps, yeah. so we can give them as a third dose, which is almost like updated because now we actually match the genotype of circulating mumps. So then in, in that case, you already have a built-in immunity. It may not be perfect, but then if you put in the third dose, and it, it may be more acceptable. So that's kind of my right, strategy. Right. And, and of course, then, you know, as you know, developing a human vaccine not only takes years, but takes hundreds of millions of dollars to, to move forward. So you have many candidate vaccines. Which one do you think has the best chance of getting into people? Well, it, it all depends. Like Prince, I mentioned to you a few years ago, we made a, a, a Ebola vaccine. If you ask me before three months ago, whenever we have an Ebola vaccine going into human, I would say, well, probably very slim chance. But you, there are times that the events <laughs> beyond our control, yeah. right? And people now suddenly get very um, interested about um, an Ebola vaccine, especially um, you know, some of the, the concern raised about the transmission around if ever being changed. Um, but also for um, the, the uh, H7, again, right now we have very little evidence H7 and 9 and transmits efficiently among human. And again, if, if those things happen, I, I would say the, the flu vaccine will um, hopefully um, get the seed in human first. But meanwhile, we just, you know, we're uh, working with Dr. Paul Spielman at uh, Emory and, and developing an HIV vaccine. And there is a lot of interest in um, taking that to human quickly. And our, of course, our RSV vaccine has been working really well um, in our uh, experimental systems. So, um, you know, whatever works, I, I take it as a win. You know, um, you, you could be the next Maurice Hilleman of vaccines, right? He made like 10 human vaccines, right? Maybe uh, that's your fate. Well, no, I, I wish, I could, like I said, I have a modest the, the hope in life that is if, if I can do something, yeah. um, at the end of the day, I'll be very happy because I, we're, we're scientists. We do science because we like it. But on the other hand, I do think um, we do have a responsibility to make our work um, useful to society because certainly all the, the science didn't, you know, come, you know, the support of science didn't come off my own pocket. The taxpayer has been supporting and society has been supporting our research. So I really feel, um, you know, besides the enjoyment of pursuing knowledge and the curiosity of our own, we really like to do something that, that's, that's a benefit to society. For I have kids, and it's easy to explain. So look, daddy makes a vaccine. Look, that's what I did. Instead of trying to explain them how important it's to understand virus and host interaction, yeah. how that's going to impact vaccine development, you know, five sentences, I mean, two sentences, I lost them. So if you say vaccine, trying to say, get a shot. You get a shot, that's good. So you probably know Roberto Catania right. works on measles, and he has 
uh, a measles vector. It's used for tumor therapy. Right. And one, they had a very successful trial in patients with multiple myeloma right. recently. And uh, it, it made the news, of course, because one of the women who was treated is in complete remission and right. she's cured. So he said uh, he was in the lab and his daughter called uh, from high school and she said, Daddy, why didn't you tell me you cured cancer? <laughs> and he said, well, I didn't. It was just one case. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do one. Well, scientists being very humble. Yeah. <laughs> Roberta, it's a, a, a very, you know, you, I'm glad you mentioned, actually, look at this dog, right? So we, we are doing the same thing using PIP5 as uh -huh. a therapeutic agent for dogs. And this is one of the really, really an interesting and kind of a situation. When I was working on PIP5 as a, a, a vector or mm -hmm. as a therapeutic for uh, cancer, as you know, we always came to a standstill when you uh, do cancer research. That is, you try... Um, a therapy with a mouse. A mouse. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you can use an immunocompetent, uh, uh, compromised animal model like nude mice, so you can grow human tumor, so you can study right. human. Or you can use immunocompetent, which is mouse model of mouse cancer. Very few people care, right? You do your work, and publish a paper, or show your result, look great. But the, what do you do next? Which is the next step is really take it to human, which the, the, the cost. And, and this is tremendous. Yeah. So being in a vet school, and I had a conversation with my colleagues and who are veterinarians and tells me that the cancer is a huge problem in dogs. And that kind of light bulb went head in, you know, in, my, in my empty head and thinking, hey, that's just a great idea. We can do clinical trial, right? Taking all a virus and, sure. and, and, um, into an uh, immunocompetent animal and the best part of it is the, the, the cancer is naturally occurring. So what we're doing right now, we're doing a, a clinical trial for, for dogs mm -hmm. with cancer in our um, hospital. So if you, anyone got a dog, uh, bring it in. We will we'll wow. give them a try. Great. So I want to wrap up by asking you a couple of uh, questions about replication. So right, right now we are revising our virology textbook. You know, we use VSV as the model for negative strand genome replication, right? and I want you to just tell me the latest. So you have this negative strand, gene, and of course you've done similar work with mumps and uh, PIV5, I presume, so the principles are probably similar with differences. You have a negative strand genome coded with nucleoprotein, right? and the polymerase is the L protein? Right, with a cofactor, it's a P protein. P protein, and the P is necessary so that can uh, attach to the NP, bound to the RNA. Right, right. There's a chaperone, and um, does more. I'm pretty sure. So in the virion, that's what you have. You have L. You have some L and P bound to it, and then it copies the genome and makes messenger RNAs. Right, right. So uh, the, the polymerase initiates and terminates, polyadenylates, and so on, all the way down the genome. Correct. Right. At some point, then you stop making or you, you reduce messenger RNA synthesis and you start making full length plus strands. Right. So what is the switch for that? Ah, so that's one of my favorite topic. And then my theory and is that um, because the P protein, which is called the phosphor protein, is highly phosphorylated, we believe the, the P protein uh, might regulate this process. And it depends on how much you have, maybe how well you phosphorylate it, maybe that's a, there's a switch between um, uh, uh, replication um, or from transcription complex to replication complex. And that, that may not be just uh, um, them alone. Maybe there's a host protein. depends on the configuration you have and will um, allow them um, to do this. And one of the things I suspect um, between you know, transcription and replication is that I suspect the replication probably is going to go a little bit faster because the, the transcription, as you know, the um, uh, negative strain has this really unique way of polyadenylation that sit on a, a, a stretch of U residues right. sliding back, which incidentally, this is not very different. One of our uh, graduates in starting T7. T7 polymerase, uh, believe it or not, that this is sitting on the track of U with sliding back, doing the same thing. Wow. So if you think about it, I, I was talking about the polymerase, right? the polio, T7, and PFE5, we are, some DNA virus had all the same kind of module yeah. of a right-hand structure. And, and it's just kind of maybe a little bit different variation on how well you hold on to your template 
what is the nucleotide um, preference when you um, incorporate your um, um, new um, sequence, right. RNA or DNA, right. et cetera. Uh, so you think that the phosphorylation of P is a critical regulator of the switch right. from mRNA to genome replication. So can you make um, can you make changes in P that, for example, never switch to full-length replication? Right. right. Yeah. I think there were already some of the um, um, mutation made in VSV, but of course we try to find those kind of genes, those residues in the P protein for mumps. And so you will be able to make a complex will only do one without the other. And then that, uh, again, would be my... Uh, right. And then you also said there are host proteins likely involved. Right. We don't know what they are yet. No, not correct? in the case of mumps. And, and of course in the um, um, VSV, there are a couple of proteins by Banerjee since they retired now right. um, and many you know, few years ago. And again, and I think it's a, a lot of interesting you know, things will come out, I hope. I just saw him uh, in Montreal this summer. I ran oh. into him. Omeo Banerjee. Right, right. You, you do know him? Oh, yes. well. Yeah, I mean, I, when I was a graduate student, we studied his papers all the time. Right. VSV synthesis, RNA synthesis was great, yeah. Great work. A lot of uh, interesting work in, yeah. about initiation, etc. So, so that's still the model, that there is a switch. It's re regulated by P and perhaps some cellular proteins as well, right? Right. right. Yeah, I think this is a really, uh, int I mean, I have studied this since I was a student. I think it's a really interesting area, and I'm hoping be all sorted out one day. Oh, I think so, because there are um, one of the things, again, one of the, the advances we have seen, and I know if you heard, um, um, I heard Sean Will and, and got yeah. a, a, a L structure solved. Because right. you have this L protein, which is a huge, it does everything. And it does initiation, does a sliding, and, and it, so once we have the structure, does I'm it do sure. capping as well? It does capping as well, and it, you know, the, that's, uh, yeah, it's capping, it, you know, everything. And, and enzyme does everything. Right. Yeah. So the it's, 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 it's rabies has an L also. It's the same. Right. It's, it's all same. for the negative strands. Yeah. So it, I'm pretty sure for each one of them will have a little bit of a difference. For instance, the P protein of mumps is already a little bit different than others because instead of a tetramer of um, head to head tetramer, right. it's an anti parallel kind of a head to toe kind of a tetramer form of a two dimer. So I suspect there will be a little bit of variation of the same thing. But by and large, they probably have a very similar um, uh, way of right. okay. replicating and transcribing. All right. Um, before I wrap up here, I have a page, a paper here that Adrian gave me. So I want to go see some music tonight. Oh yeah. So you have to tell me. We're going to vote. The highlighted ones are the two I should. One is Georgia Theater. <laughs> Delaney Davidson, Caleb Caudle, and Pete Stein. Should I go there or the Melting Point? The Hoot with Jerica Singleton and Ren, Marion Montgomery and Glenn Denham open up. So which one, Georgia Theater or Melting Point? Georgia Theater, raise your hand. Melting Point, raise your hand. This is the same for both. <laughs> right, it's a tie. But they're, they're good choices. They're both they're good. good. You're good. Athens is really you go one of, Donnie, you want to can, can go one of them? Oh. Which one has a bar on the roof? Georgia Theater. George Theater. Yeah, Cold. It's, it's cold out, though. It's freezing. Here I came to the south, and I thought I'd be warm. Oh, heaters up there? Georgia Theater? Yeah, well, I, is that a good? Should we do that? Is that good? Idea? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I hear there's a lot of good music here. In oh, yeah. Athens. Do you guys go to hear music? Sometimes. Sometimes? Yeah. Do you believe them? <laughs> well, see, I, I came here, you know, they sold me on an REM. It's a was based here, the, the band since the, yeah. um, this band. But on the other hand, you know, of course, it tells you how old I am. <laughs> yeah. No, never mind. Well, you know, I was, a, I was a postdoc in Boston, which had a pretty good alternative uh, music scene. You're from Boston, yeah? So I used to see, I used to see a lot of good bands um, in very small clubs in Boston. I saw a band called Joy Division. I don't know if you've heard of it. And I saw it with these guys in a small club, smaller than this, um, and a bunch of others. You know, the cars got started in Boston, and so that was a pretty good scene, too. So I enjoyed that. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, in a, aside from a nice day of science, go hear some good music. Nice. Uh, so that um, is it for this episode of TWIV. You guys have anything else to say? You're okay? We, we covered oh, a good yeah, ground? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this episode will be found at TWIV dot tv and also on itunes 
And we'd love to get questions and comments. Uh, we usually read them on every episode. So do send them to twiv at twiv.tv and, and we'll get to them eventually. And I want to thank my guests uh, for joining me from the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine here in Athens at the University of Georgia, Biao He in the Department of Infectious Diseases. Thank you so much for joining me today. And Jean Fu from the Department of Pathology. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys, for talking about your cool work. Uh, and I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me uh, at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. I forgot to thank the dog. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's not too late. <laughs>